together we're gonna value Walgreens to see if it's a buy or a sell. I'm gonna go through lots of high level information and then pick apart their financials later on. This video is packed with info, so don't skip any parts. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid cap company, 9.2 billion market cap. They're trading at 1066 a share and they have 860 million shares outstanding. Walgreens has three segments, US retail pharmacy, international and US healthcare. In the US, they operate many retail drug stores. You can also find them in the UK, Ireland, and Thailand under the Boots brand. They operate Benavides in Mexico and the drugstore Ayumada in Chile. They were founded in 1909, headquartered in Illinois. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. It doesn't get much worse than this. 4 billion down to 2 billion, down to 100 million, down to negative 360 million. Their revenue is going up, it's just their expenses are getting so high and they're getting squeezed. Their margins were really low, 3%, down to 2%, down to 0%, now it's negative. Net income is a profit or loss on the income statement, it's revenue minus expenses. That did go up from 2.5 billion to 4.3 billion. Then a pretty big negative in 2023, then a really big negative in 2024. Lots of write downs, lots of impairments. Revenue is a sales for the company and that does look good from 132 billion to 148 billion, a ton of revenue. They pay a really high dividend 9% and that's an inflated yield because their stock price is coming down so much and they cannot afford the dividend, they have negative free cash flow. So they need to take on debt to fund their dividend payment. They may cut their dividend or eliminate it totally. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, it's all cash flows past year four, that's 17 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $14 billion. We divide that by 860 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $16. They're trading at $11, so they're trading at a 33% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The stock has come down so much, it does seem like it's a great value, but do you want to catch a falling knife? I'm a little concerned that it's going to keep going down. So that's why I'm on the fence whether I'm going to buy it or not. There are six companies in the same industry as WBA, and if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. When they open up a new drugstore, they usually have to spend a lot in CapEx. They spent $1.6 billion. They're really leveraged, debt to equity ratio of 2.4. That means for every dollar of equity, they have $2.40 of debt. They pay a really high dividend, 9%, the only company in this industry to pay a dividend. A big negative and free cash flow works on this list. They're by far the biggest company on this list. The other five are tiny. They have a good price to book, stock price of a book value per share. They're trading below one times book value. We can't look at their PE, negative earnings. We can't look at their price to free cash flow, negative free cash flow. Investors are paying 10 cents for $1 revenue. Their revenue is so much higher than their market cap. That's why their price to sales looks so attractive. And they're not growing that much anymore. Their five year annual revenue growth rate is 1%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 33% discount, ranking seven out of 10. It looks really attractive because the stock price is so low than what it was a year or two ago. Would I buy it? I'm not 100%, so I gave it seven out of 10. I think I would buy it at these levels, but I totally get the hesitancy if you don't buy it. Ratio is two out of 10. We can't even look at their PE or price of free cash flow. Financials 5 out of 10 because their revenue goes up year after year, a ton of revenue. Free cash flow looks awful though. And of course they pay that really sweet dividend of 9%, which is a cherry on top. They recently completed their 2024 fiscal year. Let's look at their presentation slides. Fourth quarter revenue 37.5 billion. That's up 6%. That's a good growth, 6%. Better than what we saw in 21, 22, and 23. I mean, still 6% is not amazing. It's a little better than inflation. That is an improvement for them. Operating income negative 1 billion. That's down 500 million from last year. That's comparing the fourth quarter of 23 to the fourth quarter of 24. Net earnings negative 3 billion, which is 2.8 billion worse than last year. So last year they had a small negative. Negative EPS of 348 on an adjusted basis, it's positive 39 cents. Adjusted means they add back things like stock-based compensation and other non-cash or non-recurring items. 
The reason for the big loss in the fourth quarter was from a big loss on a $2.3 billion non-cash charge on a deferred tax asset. Because these drug companies have gotten hit hard from the opioid crisis. Also a big goodwill impairment from Carecentrix. That's a Chinese investment. A goodwill impairment is when you write down the value of goodwill in your balance sheet and pass through the loss onto your income statement. The way goodwill gets onto your balance sheet is when you acquire another company for more than they're worth. The first segment they list is U.S. Retail Pharmacy. $29 billion revenue, up 6.5%. Positive gross profit of $5 billion. Positive operating income of $220 million. In the U.S. Pharmacy, sales up 10%. Prescriptions up 1.5%. Prescriptions excluding immunizations up 1.6%. In their international segment, revenue 6 billion, adjusted gross profit 1.3 billion, operating income 230 million. Boots revenue is up big, up 10%. That's one of the few bright spots in their financials. For full year 2024, Boots is up 5%, so they had a really good fourth quarter. In their U.S. healthcare financials, revenue of 2.1 billion, adjusted gross profit a quarter billion, operating income 17 million. And their sales are led by Village MD 1.5 billion, Carecentrix 400 million, and Shields 200 million. Shields is up 28%. That had some nice growth. Operating cash flow 1 billion, capex 1.4 billion. Cash flow is getting really hurt by legal matters, 934 million, mainly from the opioid crisis. And this is such an old company, especially the boots part, that a big pension payment, 386 million. Here's their 2025 targets, 147 billion to 151 billion of revenue, adjusted operating income, 1.6 to 2 billion, and adjusted EPS, a buck 40 to a buck 80. They have a lot of debt, so they're projecting to pay $600 million of interest on their debt. That's for 2025. And the interest expense should be getting higher because of higher refinancing costs. That means when they refinance a the debt, they take on higher interest rate debt to pay the lower interest rate debt. Interest rates are just getting higher. There's not much they can do. Let's look at their 10K. Here's their income statement, 2022, 2023, and 2024. Revenue goes up each year from 133 billion to 148 billion. I like to learn how a company generates their revenue, so let's look for this number. Here's a breakdown of the 148 billion of revenue. US revenue, 116 billion. 89 billion in pharmacy, 27 billion in retail. Pharmacy is going up quite a bit, up about 10% from 2022. Retail is down. Retail is a rough game. It's going down each year from 28.6 to 28.2 to 26.9. International revenue is 23.6 billion. Pharmacy is down. That may be due to foreign currency conversion. Retail is up 6.9 to 7.9. Wholesale is up 11.2 to 12.1. Their third segment is US healthcare. That's up a ton from 1.8 billion to 8.3 billion. But they have an operating loss in US healthcare, a loss of 134 million. They do have positive operating income in US retail pharmacy and international. Here is a breakdown of their revenue by country. US is the biggest, of course, 111 billion to 124 billion. That goes up each year. Germany is second biggest. You would have thought UK, but no, it's Germany. That went from 11.2 billion to 12.1 billion. UK is up from 8.9 billion to 9.6 billion. And then other countries like Chile, Mexico, and Thailand. That went from 1.8 to 1.9 billion. Let's go back to the income statement. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly tied to generating the revenue, like the cost of labor and the cost of products. That goes up each year from 104 billion to 121 billion. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. That's down from 28 billion to 26.5 billion. And their SGNA is higher than their gross profit. Plus, they had a big impairment, which is why they have an operating loss of 14 billion. If you want to know what SGNA is, you can just search the term. That consists of salaries and employee costs, occupancy costs like rent. Also part of SGNA is depreciation and amortization, credit card fees, and other store expenses. It also includes headquarter expenses, advertising costs, warehousing costs, and insurance. Their interest expense, the interest they pay on their debt is 480 million, a pre-tax loss of 14 billion, 1.2 billion of taxes, a net loss of 15.4 billion. The reason they pay taxes 
is because impairments are stripped out when calculating taxes. Depreciation lowers your pre-tax income, but impairments do not. So you save in taxes on depreciation, but you don't save in taxes on impairments. So of course they had a loss per share of 10 bucks, and their shares outstanding are going down, so that's good, 864 million to 863 million. Let's take a look at their balance sheet. Their assets are 81 billion. Current assets, those are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months, 18 billion. Current liabilities, 27 billion, a really bad current ratio. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. You wanna be above one. They're below one, which means they may need to add debt to get through the next 12 months. Their largest current asset is inventory. They always have a lot of inventory on hand. Just walk into any store, you'll see the inventory, 8.3 billion. Their biggest asset is 20 billion operating lease right of use assets. These are assets they lease from other companies. So it's carried on the balance sheet as if they own it. So even though the asset is 20 billion, they owe a similar amount in the liability section, 20.9 billion. Lots of goodwill from all the acquisitions they do, nearly 16 billion. Here's a breakdown of the goodwill. 11 billion of the goodwill is from US retail pharmacy acquisitions, 1.4 billion from international, 3.2 billion from US healthcare. So their total assets are down quite a bit from 97 billion to 81 billion. The reason it's down is the goodwill impairments. Goodwill was 28 billion, now it's 16 billion. But goodwill is a meaningless asset. There's no value there, you can't sell it. 69 billion of liabilities similar to last year. Current liability is 27 billion. Their biggest is trade accounts payable. This is how much money they owe other companies when they buy on credit. When you take their total assets, 81 billion, minus total liability, 69 billion, you get their equity of 12 billion. Equity is the value of the company according to the balance sheet. Paid in capital is how much they raise from selling stock, 10.6 billion. Retained earnings is how profitable they are as a company, 23 billion. But they buy back a lot of stock, 21 billion of their own stock. So that does bring down their equity balance. So that makes me a little more comfortable because if they need money, they can just sell stock since they bought back so much. Let's look at the cash flows. This is how you run a business on cash. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, the first section, you start with the net loss of 15 billion. Then you add back the non-cash items. You have to add back that big impairment. You have to add back depreciation. So they actually have positive operating income of 1 billion, which is really low because two years ago was 4 billion and probably five, six years ago is probably close to 10 billion. They spend 1.4 billion of CapEx, which is higher than their operating cash flow. So that's why they have negative free cash flow. The last two years, they had positive free cash flow because their operating cash flow was higher than their CapEx spend. In their financing section, we could see all the debt they use, 31 billion of debt. They added that debt to pay down debt that was due. They paid 1.3 billion of dividends, lower than last year. Let's take a look at the stock on Simply Wall Street. It's last price 11, 9 billion market cap. It is up 17% in the past week, so there's some hope, but down 49% in the past year. Here's the stock price since 1990. It pretty much had a steady run up from 1990 to 2015. Its highest point ever was $96. I feel really bad if you bought it above 80, because you'd be down like 80 to 90%. From 2015 to 2018, it fell a lot from 95 to 65. Things seemed really good in 2018. It went from low 60s to low 80s. But ever since the end of 2018, it just fell off a cliff. Especially from mid 2021 to current. You just couldn't catch a break with this stock. Simply Wall Street is real bullish at 24 bucks. They say the stock is 55% undervalued. 14 analysts are not as bullish. They're at $11 a share. Their free cash flow back in 2021 was over 4 billion. In the beginning of this year, it fell to 1.8 billion. This is for the trailing 12 months. The forecast is a modest positive free cash flow. Half a billion in 25, 400 million in 26, 800 million in 27. Their revenue does look real good. It doubled from 70 billion in 2013 to nearly 150 billion currently. They do have a lot of debt. It was 5 billion in 2013. Its highest was 19 billion in 2017. The reason their debt gets so high is from acquisitions. But they have been trimming their debt. It's down to 9.5 billion currently. But equity is always higher than their debt, so that's a good sign. At any time frame, equity is higher. Although right now it's not that much higher, mainly because their goodwill came down a lot. Their goodwill was a lot higher last year, which meant their equity was higher. 
And this green line is their cash. They don't keep that much cash on their balance sheet. Currently 3.1 billion. At least not a lot relative to their debt and equity. If you are buying this stock, it's probably because of the dividend. A 2% yield in 2014, it's over 9% currently. Actually, this says 10%. The forecast is 9% by 2027, but I have a pretty good feeling it's gonna be zero soon because they're gonna probably cut their dividend or suspend it entirely. They have a new CEO, Tim Wentworth. Not much info here. In the past year, there's been insider buying and selling. I can't believe people are selling at these prices, but I guess if you need money, you need money. 62% of the companies owned by institutions, 21% by the general public and 17% by private companies. Stefano Piscina, the Italian billionaire, his company NewSip is the biggest shareholder at 17%. The next biggest shareholder is Vanguard, then BlackRock, State Street Capital Research. Invesco owns 2.25%. Schwab owns 0.88%. Norgus Bank, the Norwegian bank, 0.8%. Goldman, 0.6%. Numeric Investors, I love that name, the Boston investment firm, 0.4%. Their employee count is real high. It got to 370,000 in 2015, but it's come down to 250,000. And the ticker trades in a lot of places in NASDAQ, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Zicha, London Stock Exchange, Wiener Börse, EURTLX, BATS Europe, Sao Paulo Bolsa, and Buenos Aires. If you want to get really good at understanding financial statements, watch this video in the upper right hand corner. Talk to you soon. Thanks.